Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and I hope you enjoy this episode. Thanks go to Jeremy for prompting this episode actually because he recently reminded me that we should do an episode with Sarah Williams from the Tough Girl Tribe and I just hadn't got around to organising it so thank you Jeremy for uh, prompting that. So today I'm here talking to Sarah Williams, founder of Tough Girl Challenges and the host of the Tough Girl podcast. And you recently walked the Wales Coast Path as part of the 10 year anniversary. So we're just going to catch up and see how that went for you. So hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you doing? Good. So are you are you fully recovered? I am fully recovered. Uh, yes. What a, what a challenge. 870 miles in 50 days. And when I when I planned it, I don't think I took into account maybe just taking a rest day. And uh, I actually did end up taking one rest day. Otherwise, it was out there every day for 50 days, averaging about 20 miles per day. But it was incredible. You know, so many sights to see, so many beautiful views. Uh, yeah, just what an experience, what an opportunity. So I have filmed it all. So there are vlogs, daily vlogs available for people to go and watch so that they can see, you know, what it was like while being out there on the trail. So for people who don't know it, it's going to sound quite obvious that the Wales Coast Path is Wales Coast. But can you tell us a little bit about what the path is and and where it goes? Absolutely. So it it starts from Chester and heads 870 miles around to Chepstow, which covers the entire coast of Wales, basically. And it takes you past places like Rill and Bangor around Anglesey, um, past Aberystwyth. People have probably heard of the Pembrokeshire coast path and the gower um, and you head all the way down to the to the south uh, south of wales where you're passing through swansea and cardiff sort of all the way up to to chester so it's really diverse there's stunning scenery there's loads of historical sites of interest you know especially sort of castles there is also some industrial sites as well with nuclear power stations like there's wilbur power station on anglesey uh, it's an incredible pathway that the Wales Coast Path organisers put together, like you said, you know, sort of 10 years ago. So the Wales Coast Path was launched on the 5th of May. 20, oh, no, I'm literally like, oh, yeah, 2012. I was like, do, you, <laughs> do the maths, take 10 years off. And it's just it's just incredible that you can start off in Chester and follow a continuous footpath all the way around the coast of Wales. So, yeah, I mean, it's really, really beautiful. You walk through, you know, national parks and areas of outstanding natural beauty and with the Cicerone guidebook it breaks it down for you into sort of 57 different stages. It is a brave lady or perhaps a a tough girl that reduces the time that Paddy Dillon suggests. Paddy Dillon is a fairly well-practiced walker and he suggests doing it in 57 days so you thought nah I'm going to do better than that and take a whole week off. How was that trying to fit it into even fewer stages? Do you know, it it worked out okay. Initially, see, I wasn't going to put any time pressure on myself. And I was thinking, you know, I'll just take two months, I'll just start walking. And then I had like various commitments. And then I realized, oh, my goodness, it's my mum's birthday. And then you start working backwards, like, when can I actually start? And I think it's always very easy because through the, through the guidebook, they break it down into sections. So there's nine sections from North Wales, Isle of Anglesey, the Lynn Peninsula. Um, some of them I can't pronounce, uh, <laughs> but like the Gower and, and South Wales. And I actually followed the book for the, until I got to uh, finish the end of Anglesey. And then I just started reducing it down by one day. And I was fine, really. The distances were great and the other thing that happens when you're hiking as well is your body does adapt to hiking so you know after the first couple of days it's like your mind switches your body switches like oh okay this is what we're doing every day we're going to be walking and because you you get your like your walking legs or your trail legs it actually becomes a lot easier to hit those miles and I think one of the key lessons that I do as well or one of my top tips is is trying to start early So, you know, at least sort of starting or getting up, like the alarm will go off at sort of six o'clock in the morning. And if you could be walking by about seven o'clock, 
it just makes for a really, really pleasant day. And I don't really stop for a huge amount of breaks as well. I'm just, I'm not a fast walker by any means, but I'm just very, I'm very slow. I'm just very um, consistent with my, with my walking and just trying to take in all the sights and the views. And, you know, look, if, if my body's feeling tired and I need a little break, then absolutely I will have one, you know, a couple of times the sun was shining and it was glorious. And I was thinking, do you know what? I feel a little bit tired here. Maybe I'll just have a little, <laughs> I'll just have a little afternoon nap. And so, you know, just stop for, for an hour and just sort of had a little mid morning snooze, which was, uh, which was great. And then, you know, you'll get to a point where you come to a, to come to a campsite or your accommodation for the evening. And it's like, yeah, do you know what? I've done a really great day's walking and um, yeah, it was, it was fabulous. But this is the thing with the Wales Coast Path though, is, you know you know your body you know how you hike you know what's going to work well for you you know what your sweet point is with regards to mileage you know I think mine is probably around sort of 17 18 miles when when I start going beyond that I do notice the difference like I think I out of the 50 days I had two days which were longer than 26 miles and you do feel quite tired after those days but it is just all about making it work for you and you built in some fast packing as well didn't you as a way to get through those miles so again just explain a little bit of what fast packing is and why that how that's different to walking yeah so normally when I hike I in my backpack I'm carrying like my tent my therma rest my sleeping bag you know my food everything that I need to sustain me for the whole trip and when you're fast packing what you do is basically you empty out everything from your backpack that you don't need and just take the essential so for me that would be my waterproofs, my sunscreen, you know, snacks for the day, water, uh, the Cicerone guidebook, obviously. <laughs> and then your backpack is so much lighter so that, that then you can actually just go a lot faster. On the first day, so day one, uh, which I did on the 19th of April, it's very sort of fast and flat from going out from Chester, having, heading along the River Dee. And there was, because I live about 40 minutes away from Chester, I knew that my parents would be able to collect me at the end of the day. And I'd be able to, you know, do about sort of 18 miles. And I had a friend come and join me, actually, um, Ari Beresford-Webb, who was the first woman to uh, run around the Wales Coast Path when it first opened. She actually finished her run on the on the 5th of May 20, 2012. And so she came and joined me and we and we headed out to Fast Pack. And so I didn't I, I definitely planned the first day's walking with uh, do, doing it fast packing. And then I didn't actually plan any future fast packing days. It was more a case of if I was staying with somebody uh, for two nights and then, then it would be like, OK, I can leave all my stuff with them for the evening because they're going to be collecting me later on. So it's, it's just it's just a great way of, of breaking it up. So I did that. I had about six days of fast packing, um, although sometimes it's a bit of a shock when you um, actually head back onto the trail with a fully laden pack again. And you're like, oh, yeah this is heavy now this is heavy so but generally you know the lighter you can go the faster you can go the easier it is on your body so yeah so accommodation wise you did a little bit of camping you've mentioned that you had a tent to carry but you also did stay at places in between so yeah what was that like having the, the mixture of the two it was great, actually. So I actually, one of the things that I did is every day that I was out on the trail, I actually kept stats from, you know, where I was walking to and from, what type of accommodation I was staying at, you know, was I wild camping, was I camping, was I in a bed, was I staying with friends, how much did I spend on accommodation? And so it's, it's really interesting. So I do have some stats that I can share with you. <laughs> so from everything from uh, from from the costs and how many days were sort of free gifted accommodation and that's when I stayed with members of the tough girl tribe or people reached out to me on social media and were like hey you're walking through my area do you fancy staying with me so I free slash gifted accommodation was actually 31 days which is really a lot and I actually I paid for accommodation for 19 days I slept in a tent for 20 nights I was in a campsite for 14 nights I wild camp for six nights so 30 days I slept in a bed uh, two of those days I slept in my own bed two days were actually spent on a boat 12 nights with with friends I stayed in a and b for three nights there were six nights in hotels one night in an Airbnb two nights in a hostel the <laughs> cheapest was camping which was like five pounds the most expensive accommodation, which was gifted, was you know 125 pound, but that did include you know five course dinner and breakfast oh, wow. in, in the morning, which which was fantastic. So I ended up spending the the accommodation cost was 780 pounds, 
and not including gifted. So taking off £490 for that, I ended up spending £292 on accommodation. So it was a real mixture. And this is the thing with the Wales Coast Path. You know, you do have that, the choice over where you're staying, whether or not you want to stay in a and b every night, you want to stay in really, really nice hotels, you want to rough it and stay in, in, in campsites, or you want to try a little bit of a bit of wild camping. There is a massive spectrum. What I would say, there are certain sections on the Wales Coast Path where there's quite limited accommodation. So one of my quite stressful days was was actually from the from the stretch in North Wales. So after Prestatyn, heading to Bangor, that was really really devoid of um, of campsites. They were quite sort of few and far between. And especially when I got to Bangor, I was really really struggling. I was thinking, there's there's nowhere up that I can stay, and there's nowhere. Um, that I could, like, especially when you're you're doing it on on a budget as well, and I actually ended up looking on Warm Showers. So Warm Showers is actually uh, it's a website which is normally used by cycle tourists, and I've used it over in America. And you reach out to people, and they let people come and stay, and you know have a warm shower. And sometimes it's they feed you dinner. Sometimes it's just you know a, a bed and shower. And I reached out, and there was a, a couple. And I, I, I messaged them and I said, look, I know this is really cheeky. I have used warm showers before. I have done cycling, but I'm walking the Wales Coast path. Um, I'm really struggling for accommodation in Bangor. You know, would you have would you be having the availability to have me come and stay like tonight on a Friday night? Um, that was done in the, the morning. I was leaving, like I think, Conway in the morning, not knowing where I was going to end up staying. And this lovely couple messaged me back straight away. Yeah, no problem at all. Gave me the address. The address was right on the coast path. Oh, um, that's great. Yeah. But then it was like, we've just moved in as well. So we haven't built your bed as yet. So, you know, did it. So it's like, <laughs> I was thinking, oh, my God, this is, this is actually quite stressful. But, you know, I, I, I even messaged back saying, oh, look, you know, I, I'm, I've got an air mattress. I can just blow my air mattress up. You know, please don't worry about, about that at all. But, you know, this is one of the things that, that I've definitely found on my walks is just, you know, the kindness of people, the people who are willing to, to help you out and offer you accommodation and give you advice and, and tips. Um, yeah, so, so accommodation can be, can be quite challenging, but you can make it work. So, yeah, it's just involving being, doing a little bit more planning, to be honest, and, you know, going on and going through, through the websites to try and find accommodation, giving them a quick call in the morning. Hi, do you have availability? Yes or no. And obviously I wasn't doing it at the height of summer as well. Um, yeah. But we definitely noticed uh, when I, was, I started walking with Alex Mason for the second half of the journey. And when we were down in, in South Wales, there was, um, it was, it was the, ju- it was the Jubilee a bank holiday weekend. I think it was the kids half term. Like there was loads of holidays because we were like, we were looking at like an Airbnb for, for somewhere um and it wasn't even like a good room or something it was like 300 pounds for like a double bed and we were just like why is it so expensive and there was um there was a football match on Wales had got into the world cup or the the final and and they were playing this match and so we were just like this like where are we going to stay so I mean luckily the the person that we were saying was like oh you know look don't worry about it just stay with us for for another night but sometimes, you know, you can have curveballs like that thrown at you, which is just sort of unexpected. But you will always find a solution. I know wild camping isn't it's it's not actually legal in Wales, but some people do decide to do that, making sure, obviously, that they leave no trace and, and all of that. So at some of these squeeze points where you were struggling to find accommodation, did you think about wild camping? definitely I, and I had to do it on I think like two occasions where I didn't actually want to wild camp because I needed to like charge my electronics and I just wanted a bit of I don't know just uh just I don't know just like the security of a campsite because it can be quite stressful when you're wild camping especially as like a solo female and I'm quite pedantic about where I do wild camp so you're wanting somewhere which is hidden um uh, that can't be easily seen it's obviously flat ground you're basically you're looking for the perfect place to wild camp and sometimes you just can't find it and you know other times you'll be walking along and you'll find somewhere at like two o'clock and be like, oh that'd be perfect for wild camping but it's too early to stop and then yeah. you know one day I I was started to look to, so for so much camp at about 4 30 and I was still walking at nine o'clock and I was right in the middle of nowhere on the coast and it was starting to go dark. And I was thinking, actually, this is just going to have to do where I am. It's the flattest place I can find. 
you know, I haven't seen anybody for hours. It's so remote. No one's going to come across me. And obviously, like you said, I think the really important thing is, you know, for, for people who are wild camping, you're getting there late, you're packing up your tent, and then you're packing up early. You're obviously taking all of your rubbish away with you. So, you know, when I leave a wild camping spot, you would never have known that I was there. And, and that's what it's all about. It's being, it's being respectful. And obviously, you know, it's not about uh, wild camping when there's, when there's like animals or camp, wild camping in people's gardens or, you know, anything like that. Although I did have... <laughs> <laughs> there was one I was walking along and there was um there was this like perfect like hidden uh like wild camping spot sort of like behind these hedges and it um and it didn't the land didn't look as though it was being used because there was a little bit of rubbish around there it didn't look that tidy and again it was quite late it was quite dark and I was thinking that nobody's coming nobody's going to know it's you know I'll be so hidden I'll be gone and you know be honest in the next eight hours I will have left and so um yeah put my put my tent up got all comfy and cozy and then next thing I hear a car driving along and it's now like half 11 at night and then dogs start barking I was like oh no and so there was uh there was a couple there with their with their dog and so I obviously got out of the tent and just said hi you know and apologize I'm so sorry would you like me to move and they were just like laughing and saying oh my god no it's not a problem da, da, da. um so, I mean, that, that was quite awkward. And sometimes these things could happen. Um, so that, I didn't obviously pick the best wild camping spot in that, in that instance. But I thought I had. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so why were they there with their dogs? Because it was their holiday home. <laughs> oh, so they'd just seen that you were there. Yeah. Well, no, no, because it was, uh, it was, it looked like sort of deserted, like the, the area, like where, if, when you walk past it, you think, oh, no, nobody's going to be coming. It was a, it was like a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, you're thinking midweek, holiday owners aren't going to be coming midweek, they're more likely to come at the weekend. Well, I thought, oh, oh, you know, I feel pretty good, you know, I feel pretty sure that this is going to be a good spot, but <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't. But, you know, you make mistakes, you live and learn, but most, most people are generally very relax and very cool so yeah and like you know like we've both said if you if you're responsible I don't think they would even have made it an, an illegal thing if it wasn't for that risk of people not doing it responsibly um you know there's been a lot in the news about people fly fly camping I think they started to call it um to differentiate it from wild camping where people are leaving sometimes they're leaving their tents and they're leaving mm. barbecues and they've damaged the ground and yeah, we're obviously very careful um, not to be encouraging that in, in any way. We're always trying to encourage people to be responsible, whether they're walking or they're swimming or they're sleeping somewhere. It's it's really important to always be responsible. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. The other thing that I picked up. Right. So just to go back a, a minute. So you vlogged all of this and you with the, the tough girl stuff, you were putting out stuff on Instagram and, and everything. And you're quite open about the stuff that you share on your social media and open about things that frightened you or that stressed you out a little bit, which I think is really nice as well, not to just always be, you are a very positive person, but not to shy away from sharing these things that weren't so positive. So tell me a bit about the cows. Oh my God. <laughs> like I've, I've heard people talking about cows before and I've always just sort of thought, no like what are you talking about the cows are just you know amazing and beautiful because I've never had an issue with them and then this time they just seem to be I, I almost want to call them like the killer cows because you'd be walking through fields and these cows would start sort of running up towards you and you're trying to go around them and one time I was right on the coast walking through the field with cows and the cows were starting to follow me and they were bucking and really staring at me like I'm probably making it more in my head but almost like very aggressive and I'm obviously you know I'm walking slowly I'm walking away from them as much as possible but it's actually really quite intimidating when you are having to go through cows and they're starting to run towards you so I had like three different instances where what I would say it was quite early in the morning and I don't know if the cows thought that maybe I was the farmer coming to feed them because they'd start sort of like charging along, running. It just started to make me more and more anxious as time went on. 
and then, I don't know, I just, I started to really, really dislike it. And then I'm, I'm fine when I'm with another person. I don't know. I just sort of helps to build your confidence. If there's somebody else there, you're like, well, like when I was walking with Alex or Sally Kettle, I could be like, right, you, you go, you go first and you can look, you know, look out for it. But it was, it, it was starting to get like quite, quite concerning and then like there are accidents with cows like because at, at the end of the day even if they're, they're not trying to be malicious or or hurt you they are still big big animals and they can trample you and injure you and and hurt you and so I really started to dislike the areas where I had to walk through the fields where there was no separation between sort of me and me and the animals I don't there were some incredible farmers who'd made it really clear where I was meant to be walking. They, they'd had a, like a separate area for the walk for the walkers with a fence, bit of barbed wire, all good. And that actually, that helped me a lot. But I was starting to, yeah, really, really dislike the cows. And the other thing that I had a problem with was dogs, really aggressive dogs who were, like you, you come to a gate and you can see the mark of the Wales Coast Path and going through a farm and you can see the other gate. And there's two dogs going absolutely crazy at you, but there's the nobody else dogs. there. The farm dogs, yeah. Mm. And there's nobody else there. And then you sort of like, well, I've got to get to the other side. So, you know, you'd walk slowly through and they'd be growling at you and quite aggressive. And it really does sort of make your, you increase your adrenaline a bit. And sometimes like dogs can actually just go for you. And, and this isn't about putting fear into people because... I think, you know, I, I always want to be really respectful of the animals. At the end of the day, I am walking through their their land, their area, and they are just doing what they are, what they are trained to do. But it was getting to the point where I was thinking, do you know what? I would prefer the bears and the snakes on the Appalachian Trail than the, <laughs> than, than the cows and the, than the dogs. Um, yeah, I, it was just something that I didn't really like. I think it's just something to to just be, almost just be aware of. And obviously I was, I was making sensible decisions as well. If there's, especially, you know, if there's a mummy, a mummy cow and a baby calf, then I, you know, I'm not getting in between them and I would take big detours around the field to, to avoid them as much as possible. But um, yeah, not yeah. a fan, not a fan. No, it's funny because I had exactly the same thing. I used to live in the countryside and there were loads of cow fields and I'd never been frightened of cows. And I had a couple of incidents when I was walking with my dog and cows would sort of come charging from like a completely different field and they'd come charging down the fields to, to get to us. The advice is always to let your dog go mm. because they're faster than you are and they'll sort themselves out. So I'd let my dog go and she'd legged it to the end of the field and gone over the stile and she was completely safe. And as soon as she did that, the cows sort of backed off. So they'd felt threatened by her presence. And then she saw me and saw that I was still there and she came back to try and help me with the cows. And as soon as she came back, the cows sort of got stressed again. And and I think, yeah, without putting fear into people, it is something that you do need to just, just be aware of and know what the sort of sensible strategies are. So like never going between the cow and a calf that's just really sensible advice and if you have got a dog knowing what the best things are to do and knowing how to not antagonize the cows because you know they're, they're not trying to be aggressive they're trying to protect themselves or in your case they might have been thinking that their breakfast was ready like it's really hard to tell but it is still quite an intimidating sight when you've got these massive animals sort of running towards you and you're kind of going oh I don't know what to do right now and I've got nowhere to go <laughs> like I'm literally on the edge of the coast I'm going to go over a cliff this is not good uh, yeah yeah apart from that what did you see any interesting wildlife or do you know uh there was quite a lot of ponies out there which I really loved seeing like I, I don't want I don't necessarily call them wild ponies but definitely ponies who were wild grazing and I don't and unfortunately I don't know the reasons why but it's meant to help the nature it helps the wildlife by having the wild ponies out there uh, the diversity of the, the wildlife yeah, yeah it helps the biodiversity so that was really cute and amazing to see like i love yeah. seeing the horses sheep oh my god the baby lambs were just the cutest thing you could ever see they were gorgeous to see out there I it's really cute when they wag their tails isn't it well, when they start feeding from their mum and they're sort of like underneath <laughs> yeah. and then it's like their tails are just going crazy. It's like, oh, my God, they're just having the best time of their life. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so gorgeous, gorgeous sheep. Love seeing that. Did see quite a lot of sheep, actually, 
who'd obviously they'd escaped from the from the fields and were sort of like out on like the path or the road and I did try and do some sheep herding me and Alex <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> somebody had obviously left left a gate open which you don't do and th- this one sheep was in this field by its uh, not a field like out on the coast path by itself instead of in the field so we we sort of like opened the gate and we're trying it like Alex had the gate open and I was trying to like what's the word you know herd the sheep through so we got it into <laughs> into the next one um so that, that was all a bit of fun and excitement uh but the other the other really beautiful thing um which I really enjoyed seeing was all the beautiful like flowers and wildlife like on the coast and and I'm not I, I really enjoy nature but I don't have the knowledge of like what the flower I just think they're really pretty and really beautiful but I walked with um there is a, a great lady and I'm going to, oh, Abby Barnes, who is, has a YouTube channel called Spend More Time in the Wild. And when I was walking with her, she is so super knowledgeable. She was walking along and said, oh, this, this moss is this, 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 and this is how it does this. And these flowers are called this, this, this. And I was like, oh, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it was really beautiful. And to be honest, just the coastline was was stunning. Like it was um I, I just I don't know if I feel as though Wales has been I mean obviously I think people do know that Wales is beautiful but I don't know if they just know how beautiful like some of the coastal stretches are especially if people haven't gone out to the there's the sort of more remote sections which are a little bit more difficult to get to they are just stunning and you know sometimes you'd walk around one corner and you'd just be like oh how is this the view like how is this <laughs> how is this here? And I would just be taking photos left, right and centre and trying to film it all to really sort of like capture the magic. But it's just, it's so, so stunning. The only, yeah. the only challenge, the only thing I say about Wales is, it or the UK is, you just cannot guarantee the weather. You know, that's, that's what you, when it's, when the sun is shining and it is glorious. And I was really lucky actually with my sunshine, I, because I kept track of it. I had sunshine for about 80% of my trip throughout um, the end of April, all of May, beginning of June. And it really was absolutely glorious. Um, but you obviously just can't guarantee that because I know people who've gone to Wales for their, for their week's holiday and it's rained every day. And it's just like, that's, yeah. that's not what you want. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, I always say to people, that is why it is so beautiful as well. Yeah. So yeah. I, I do. I kind of wish that they would figure out a way to make it rain at night time. <laughs> yeah. So that we could have the beauty, the beauty that the rain enables, but you know, that we could still go out walking without having that. Like I'm 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 not precious about walking in all weathers, but there does get to be a point, especially if you're camping and you're walking day after day, mm. where you think, I feel like I've got trench foot. Like I just really would like to not be soggy for a little bit. And walking in, in dry weather does it <laughs> does really help with that. Um but that is why we've got such beautiful landscape to, to look at. And it is interesting, that thing you said about Wales being slightly like overlooked. I think I, I grew up with this idea that you a proper holiday was in somewhere like Spain. Mm. Like that was a proper holiday. And it was just there's an undertone of, well, of course, it doesn't count if you're if you stay in the UK because the UK is not good enough or not that that was ever said but you just get this sort of feeling that you know yeah you might go camping in Wales and it'll rain for a weekend and it's miserable but a proper holiday is if you go somewhere abroad and and I think the the pandemic was quite good for making people realize what we have got in the UK and there's parts of the coast that are just absolutely glorious, you know, we're not Wales, but we were talking recently with Andrew McCloy, who's done the Great Walks on the England Coast Path book. And we were talking about some of the areas that surprised him and how there's these islands off the River Dee that are just spectacular. And Can I say, I watched that. And did so you? I, I, I live on the Wirral. And so he mentioned... He called it Hilbra Islands. And I'm like, no, no, it's Hilbury Islands. Hilbury. Hil- okay. Hilbury, Hilbury Islands. But, but yeah, and actually the, the Wirral is actually a real gem. For, I really, By the way, I've really enjoyed that, that conversation. It was really, really fascinating. Well, I really want to go there. Um, the Hilbury, I'd never, I'd, come yeah, along with I'd, me. Yeah, I'd me. love to. Yeah. I'd love to because it's. I'd never even heard of it. And it just looked amazing. And yeah, I guess the people that we are talking to are probably – more used to the UK being beautiful but it you know walking down walking around bits of of England as well you'd think well there's nothing to be seen Liverpool nothing to be seen around Liverpool and you think but actually some of the beaches are just glorious and the sculptures sculptures. yeah yeah, Yeah. the Anthony Gormley yeah 
yeah don't don't get put off exploring the UK a bit more yeah don't, it's, it's, you know I think we said at the start you know like Wales can get overlooked because it's almost like it's not seen as like a proper holiday oh my goodness it is definitely a proper holiday you will have an incredible time if you know if you love you know camping and the coast and you know there were so many you know surfers and kayakers and, and wild swimmers and just people out there enjoying it and bird watchers as well there's there's a lot to see and a lot to do and I actually you know talking about sort of art I really like seeing like pieces of art like on um when I'm walking and I think the Wales Coast Path what they're doing is they're actually introducing 10 new sculptures which they're going to be putting around the coast of Wales in, in different parts and I'm not sure when that's going live or, or happening but they all the sculptures have been commissioned but at the halfway point at, at Newquay there's actually sort of a mermaid on a statue blowing a kiss out which is which is really really cool but you know seeing stuff like that and you know those those sort of like memorable uh, moments and even at the end there's this um at the end of the path in Chepstow there's sort of a, a massive mosaic on the floor which is really really beautiful um to look at and they have these big sort of like stone pillars as well with with carvings in and even the most southwesterly point there's a you know massive um stone as well which has been engraved so you know all of that I think is really really nice to see so do you feel like you've got to know Wales a bit more as a country? Oh, massively. But I think that my biggest issue is, is my pronunciation. I just, <laughs> I just, uh, I, and I live so close to Wales. And I think it's because I try and do it phonetically um, when, I, when I read the words. And I'm just mortified by like how I, I pronounce um, some of the words. But, you know, I mean, definitely, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to do so back in 2021 when we celebrated the six year anniversary of the Tough Girl podcast. Um, and I, we, we were doing another challenge with Cicerone and I walked around like the Isle of Anglesey. And that was really, really beautiful. So I've walked around Anglesey twice now in, in both directions. And just, I don't know, it's just, it's just really, really stunning. So, yeah, I mean, there's I, there's loads of places that I'd like to go back to. I think, like, the Lynn Peninsula was amazing. Pembrokeshire, I'd, I'd love to do that section again, but I'd do it the, I'd do it the other way around. So we ended up walking from north down to down to south. And what happens when you do it that way is your views towards the end are more of, like, power stations, and it's not <laughs> the most attractive. But I think if you flip it the other way, um yeah. you'd have sort of much more in incredible incredible views but but I definitely recommend people you know get out there you know even just to do like a few day hikes or um you know the few little sections whether it's you know obviously like the Gower or Anglesey Coastal Path or uh Cridigian Cridigian way Cridigian yes I think I think that's right <laughs> that way you know there, there's these great little um shorter trips that that you can do which is yeah. really really nice yeah and then again, that's so you, you did nearly a thousand miles on the coast, but then there's all the interior of Wales that that you haven't explored. And there's things like the Cambrian Way and the Snowdonia Way, all the mountains in the in the middle of Wales. So yeah. there's a there's a lot there to like you did 50, 50 days of walking and and you've only and I say only carefully, yeah. but you you know, you've only done the coastline. So yeah, there's a lot to explore. There is, and there's Offers Dyke as well. So the end of um, the end of Chepstow, you can actually continue your walk for like another ten days and head up to Prostatin. Um, and I think that's a hundred and one hundred and seventy-seven miles, maybe something like that. So I know Cicerone has a has a guidebook for the Offers Dyke path as well. But then yeah. you can actually do the whole complete loop. And um, I have actually I've done a little bit of walking in Snowdonia. I've got, I've climbed Snowdonia quite a few times now, but I've only done like two or three of the routes up there. And there's about six or seven seven different ones. Snowden that's Snowden Snowdonia yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I've climbed Snowden a few times but yeah, yeah there's, there's so many different sort of routes um routes available to, to go and walk so yeah lots to see lots to do always yeah and actually every time Paddy Dillon um the author of the guidebook to the Wales Coast Path and Offers Dyke every time he does the Wales Coast Path he he walks up off Offers Dyke as well just just because why not well, um, he's he's just incredible because I know he he did another interview with you, didn't he? Where he came on and shared more about the ten years and how it's how it's changed, which I think yeah, is yeah. You know, absolutely fascinating. And the thing that I I still am amazed by was somebody had asked a question of, so how many miles have you walked, Patty? And I thought, you know, privately, what a ridiculous question, as if he's going to know that. Um, unless he's you know had the same Strava thing running for since he was 16 
And then he just reached over. So within within an arm's reach of where he was sitting chatting to me, and he got this massive wad of paper, and he has literally been keeping a note of all the miles that he's done. So he said, oh, I've done this many thousand miles. Um, I think it was a hundred, a hundred and something thousand miles. And but he was he was precise. And then he he emailed me the day after and said, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I hadn't put my previous day's walk on. So I was X miles out. And and actually the correct number is this. And I thought like that just he's he's so like particular and exact. It's it's exactly what makes him such a brilliant guidebook writer. I was just about to say that's why he's so good at writing out of <laughs> guidebooks that he's written because he is that detail orientated. Yeah, yeah. But I just thought that was hilarious that you could answer how many. This is how many thousand miles I've walked. And I, I, I actually, I worked. I did. I worked it out. I did a talk with um, with another adventure called Laura Kennington, and um, we worked out our total mileage, like cycled and walked. And I, I'm sure mine was. Maybe it was around like the eight thousand. That's if, it, if I include cycling, but it, um, yeah. that adds like another well four thousand kilometers on. So what's that? Three and a half thousand miles, maybe. So yeah, it is interesting. I, I'd actually, I'd be able to give you a number. Would you? <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to work it out and then I'll send you an email. Yeah, do, with, uh, with do. How, with I don't think you'll beat Paddy Dillon. Oh my god, no! I don't Nowhere think... close. I don't think I've even got. To that. I, I have not even got to ten thousand miles yet. So definitely haven't done that yet. It's insane how far he's walked. Um, Okay, we've gone slightly over time, but I've just been really enjoying talking to you. And I think I've talked to you about slightly different things because we have covered the Wales Coast Path a couple of times recently. So it's been really nice to talk about some slightly different angles with you. Um, but is there anything else that you wanted to cover off that we haven't chatted about? No, I think we've we've covered off loads. But if people want, so we talked about sort of like mentioning like details and the miles walked. I have actually kept detailed stats from from the day to day, and in part of those stats, I talked about things like you know ease of terrain. Um, subjective feeling like feelings of enjoyment giving it marks out of 10 um on on all those types of things so if there is a particular section of the wales coast path that maybe that you live close by you're thinking oh what would that be like you can have a look and on through instagram or youtube and find the individual day i've also linked it into the guidebook pages as well so you can get the guidebook open the guidebook up to say page 201 and then you can look at my posts and you'll be able to sort of watch the vlog link it to the guidebook um, and read about what that day was like for me as well so if you're a little bit concerned about taking on a certain section then you know get the guidebook look through it you can read it in the guidebook then you can watch the vlog see what it was actually like and then read my post about it as well and then if anybody does have any questions or concerns you know around the cows or anything <laughs> then you know please follow me on instagram at tough girl challenges or send me a dm you can also send me an email sarah at toughgirlchallenges.com more than happy to answer any questions and what i would say is there's no such thing as a silly question if you're thinking it other people will be thinking it as, as well and one of the things that i do is through my instagram stories i will like not publicly share i will publicly share your question but not publicly share who asked it and then answer the question so that everybody will get the benefit of the answer just get outside have fun in, enjoy it um yeah it's it's incredible what you know what an what an incredible resource that we have available to us yeah yeah brilliant and it's yeah it's all there it's all there for people to to do what they want i think that's something i'm always keen to get across is that our guidebooks they might say it's 57 stages but you know that's just a suggestion it's sometimes it's a suggestion because that's where the accommodation makes it easier to break up those days um, and sometimes there are slightly longer days because of various reasons but there's nothing to say that you can't just use that as a really loose guide and make your own walk so there are people that do it and they'll do a week here and a week there and then they'll come back and do another week there's people that do a little bit and then get on a train and do a little bit more so that's something that me and you are both quite keen on is encouraging people just to go out and do something Um, it doesn't matter if it's not the whole walk or it's not you know you're not you're not doing it all um it's just go out there and enjoy a little bit and you do you which I really hate that phrase I really hate that phrase like your own hike walk your own walk yeah yeah but that's really important you just just go out and explore and, and have a good time and hopefully hopefully enjoy it so yeah thank you Sarah that's that's been really fun and 
people can follow you and go and read more. We've got the live event that we had with Paddy that's still available to watch. We've got a podcast about it. We've got tons of articles about the Wales Coast Path. Um, and of course, we've got the guidebook that comes with all the mapping. So there's hopefully everything that you need to, to go and explore the Wales Coast Path. So yeah, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. It's been super fun. I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. I'd love to know what you think or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes, just like Jeremy did. Please email live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your podcast platform. You can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes or you can sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. I'll be back in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, please come and find us on social media. We've got a really active Facebook group called Cicerone Connect and we're on all the rest of the main social channels as Cicerone Press. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon.